is concerned. So let's start with the very first one, which is a Gaussian function. The Gaussian function or a Gaussian distribution, uh, also known as a normal distribution, is a very common distribution used in statistics and even in different fields of physics, specifically when it comes to generating large number of data points. Uh, for a variable, Gaussian distribution is very common. Even when you study different kinds of beams, lasers, you may have heard of Gaussian beams. But before that, let me uh, explain what the code is, because you don't really have to understand every single thing, but I'll just give you a general idea. So this is something that where I generate the set of uh, data points along x-axis. So I generate the range of x-axis. And then here I sort of create a range along the y-axis. What this mesh grid command does is, is generates a grid along the x-y plane. So along the x and the y-axis you have this plane and it creates a grid of various kinds of points. And if I can specify some z function with respect to every point in that grid, I essentially end up creating some sort of a surface. So that's the whole uh, style of how I'm going to plot these surfaces. I specify a range along the x-axis, I specify a range along the y-axis, I use mesh grid command to generate the x-y plane and then I'll specify either some sort of a direct function or some using some parametric variable, uh, the functional relationships between x, y and z, thereby creating some sort of a surface. So the most simplest way of creating something that resembles a Gaussian function or a Gaussian distribution is uh, exponential minus x square plus y square. So this should give us something that resembles the Gaussian function. There you have it very interesting surface right you have this xy plane as you approach the center as you approach the zero zero point the sort of uh, function rises up or the z value of the function sort of increases and you end up getting this kind of a hill kind of a structure now i can determine different parameters associated with it like where it is centered what is the nature of the spread what is the you know amplitude whether or not it is normalized by actually writing the more detailed uh, sort of uh, expression. So for the detailed expression, I'll have to introduce uh, the standard deviation. I'll have to introduce uh, uh, some kind of uh, normalizing factor also. So let's do that. So this is the most general expression where I've centered the Gaussian distribution at 0, 0, keeping the standard deviation 1, 1. Let's see what we get. Yeah, we get the same sort of a distribution. I can show you the differences of what kind of a distribution we get. So let's suppose I want to change, uh, uh, I want to change the, the where the distribution is centered at. So for that, I'll create a different set of plots. So let's suppose uh, 1, 3, 1. So let me make a comparison of three plots. This one is centered at 0, 0. Let's suppose I want to center another one at 1, 1. This is the second plot. And I want to center another one at 2, 2, minus 2, minus 2. This should give me something like, okay, there it is. So this is, a, as you see, it's centered at 0, 0, right? It's centered at 0, 0. On the other hand, this one is centered at 1, 1. It's, there's a slight difference. You can see that probably. And this is centered at minus 2, minus 2. Slight difference. All right. Now, what does this Sx, S, S, Y do? They essentially uh, tells us about the nature of the spread. Okay. So let's suppose uh, I have a spread of 2 here and a spread of 0 0.5 along the Y axis. If I do that, then watch sort of uh, plot should I get you see it gives us an idea about the nature of the spread okay so the, the spread along the y-axis because I kept the spread along the y-axis the standard deviation to be 0 0.5 the spread is kind of less you see that but the spread along the x-axis the spread is quite high because I kept it this this the standard deviation to be 2 you see the difference? It's not sort of uniform along x and y axis, but rather it's kind of non-uniform. You know, there's a greater amount of spread along the x axis as compared to the 
y axis. Wow. This is <laughs> this is nice. <laughs> hmm, this looks nice. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. So uh, what we can also do is we can decrease the standard deviation. Let's suppose we decrease its standard deviation. What do you you essentially end up seeing is that it sort of sort of the spread becomes less and less. The height will keep on increasing because I have normalized this. Essentially, if I do uh, integration, uh, the total amount of volume within this surface comes out to be one. OK, and what it does is essentially ends up creating some kind of a Dirac Delta, a two dimensional, you can say Dirac Delta function because the height will keep on increasing centered at zero zero and the integration of that surface along X and Y will come out to be one. OK, I can keep on decreasing the standard deviation. The more I decrease it, the more it will approximate a Dirac Delta function. OK. So here you essentially can see just going up. You look at the values, the values are very, very high. The height is very high. Anyways, the direct delta is just a singular point, right? So it's difficult to approximate it, but you can do it anyways. Cool. Let's move ahead. All right. Let's move ahead to what is known as the Mexican hat or the sombrero uh, function, also known as I call it, it's not known as, but I call it the ripple on the surface of water. Okay, so let's delete this and I'm going to use, again, we don't need the distribution here, SX, SY, but I do need the, where the surface is going to be centered at. So let me define some kind of a variable R. So R is essentially equal to square root of X square minus or X square plus Y square. X square plus Y square. Okay, and then this is nothing but sine of R upon R. Okay, again, because this is centered at X naught, so I can uh, introduce X minus X naught here. And at centered at Y naught, I can introduce Y minus Y naught here. All right, and uh, this gives us, I think it will give us, no, this is not what I was looking for. This is supposed to be X naught. Okay. Uh, so this gives us the sombrero function, also known as a Mexican hat or something that resembles uh, ripples on the surface of a pond. Uh, if you have ever thrown a stone on the surface of a pond or a river, then the moment the stone goes inside, it creates a blob and a set of ripples that spread out. Okay, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? At close range, it also looks like some kind of a hat. This is a very popular function because uh, it's, it's something that is very commonly used um, in in sort of image processing, uh, and and people who study you know different kinds of uh, light beams when they study the vortices of different kinds of light beams, uh, they usually mm, are familiar with. Uh, they see this kind of a uh, distribution over and over again. It's kind of very interesting. We can sort of increase the spread and see how it looks like, how the ripples look like. So if I go further, you know, if I increase the range here, okay, let's increase the range uh, along the X and the Y axis. And then we end up seeing something like this. You see this? <laughs> wow, amazing. This is the blob at the center and these ripples spread out. What if I increase it even more further, let's suppose uh, I go from minus 40 to 40 X axis and both Y axis. Let's make it 100. Number of points 100. So here. Amazing. Beautiful. This is the side view, right? This is the bottom view and this is the sort of slanted top view. Nice, beautiful. All right, let's move ahead to the next function, 
which is a hyperboloid. A hyperboloid surface, what are the equations? Well, the hyperboloid surface has a set of parametric equations. So we won't be using x, y, we will be defining some other variable. Let's suppose v and theta, okay? Let me define v and theta first. So I'll have to create a mesh grid corresponding to v and theta, okay? So I'm using these um, sort of capital letters as that corresponding to the mesh grid. And this set of parametric equations are cos hyperbolic v multiplied by cos theta and then you have y is equal to cos hyperbolic v multiplied by sine theta and then z is sine hyperbolic v let's see what we get there you have it this is the hyperboloid okay if you look from this side this looks like a hyperbolic curve you must be familiar with what hyperbolic curves are so this looks like a hyperbolic curve this looks like a hyperbolic curve and this in entirety looks like a hyperbolic surface all right how do you get a hyperbolic surface so you can imagine like some sort of a cylinder if you have a cylinder you take the top portion and the bottom portion and you sort of twist it in the opposite direction the surface you get is a hyperboloid okay uh, what if we want to sort of okay let's suppose okay let me give you a comparison huh? so if I there so this is looking like something like a cylinder here yeah? you see that i have uh, in this variable v i have decreased its value it's not exactly a cylinder but looking something like a cylinder yeah so imagine that you take the top and the bottom portion and you sort of rotate it in opposite direction the surface gets twisted and then it sort of con it, it takes this particular curve formation okay let's do that and see what we get if we increase this v what if we increase it to 2 okay if we increase it to 2 then i should see a little bit of a difference in the curve yeah there you have it you see this ah, okay okay so so you see this uh, it has taken this distinct hyperboloid surface if i further increase it let's suppose i make it uh, 4 let's suppose i should get something that resembles a cone okay i should get something that resembles a cone ah yeah there you have it it's a cone yeah you see that are you able to see this so yeah yeah so these are all hyperboloids uh, with different set of equations okay now if you uh, have seen my last lecture series on uh, minkowski space time you may remember that when we talk about two dimensional space time with one time and x axis and we made a comparison with a moving observer under lorentz transformations uh, you had these hyperbolic curves that emerge in the geometry of space-time, right? Now, if you extend the space dimension to one more, that is, if you take x and y, and then you have t, so you have a three-dimensional space-time, then instead of the hyperbolic curves, you'll have this kind of a hyperboloid. So in that sense, if you have uh, watched my earlier lecture series, so you can imagine the time axis going upward vertically and the x and y axis going perpendicular to the x, uh, sorry, parallel to the xy plane. So, awesome. Let's move ahead to the next one. The next one is a helicoid, okay? It's like a helix, but a surface. Again, we'll have to use parametric equations. Uh, so, I have rho and theta now, okay? Let's, let's type them. All right, let's plug them and plot it. Yeah, there you have it. This is like, you must be familiar with helix, right? Helix, you know? So, this is like a helix surface, okay? It's, it's not just a curve, it's a helix surface. You see this? uh i don't know if you are able to see this properly or not this is a helix surface you see so this is just one surface that is twisted okay it's kind of twisted and i can kind of increase the number of twists it have 
let's do that let's try to increase the number of twists it has so I think it's going to change if I multiply it by 2 in theta the number of twists should increase okay let's check yeah the number of twists has increased but okay let's make a comparison with the earlier one first you have one you have one you have one here and then you get this helicoid with like two turns right now if i want to increase the number of turns let us let us make it two and let's see what we get there you have it three turns three one two three now four four terms yeah and then again let me plot one more let's type three here three and three so yep 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 you see this <laughs> so this is a helix surface or helicoid you see this is one surface you take let's suppose some rectangular strip and then you twist it okay in fine and twist it and uh, that's it you get a helicoid kind of and you keep on twisting it infinitely in both directions nice right let's go ahead to the last the last one i've kept the best for the last a very interesting surface if you take uh, some kind of a rectangle you twist it once and then you join the endpoints you get just one singular surface also known as Mobius strip let's move ahead to Mobius strip okay okay so Mobius strip also will have to use a set of parametric equations I'll be using uh, in terms of u and v all right let's plot them and see what we get there you have it the mobius strip the very famous mobius strip you see the very interesting feature about a mobius strip is that it's just one complete surface it doesn't have two surfaces so if you follow this line it sort of goes here and then again here and then again here it sort of goes to the other side and back to its original location so if you imagine some kind of an insect that is walking on this surface and if it keeps on walking and then it'll 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 cover the entirety of its surface on what we can say as both sides it doesn't have both sides actually it just has one side how do you generate this is essentially you take a rectangular strip and then you twist it you make it one twist or half a twist and then you join both the ends it's a very famous surface, a very interesting uh, geometrical surface known as the Mobius strip. You see that? The Mobius strip. Interesting, isn't it? Wow. Beautiful. All right, there you have it, guys. Five extremely beautiful surface plots using Scilab. That is it for today. Thank you very much. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Take care.